Tiger Stadium, we will celebrate the anniversary of their world championship with a game an hour later and all here on Fox Sports Net. Our reason for being is to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the 1984 World Champion Tigers. We'll get to that in just a matter of moments. But we begin this afternoon with rather recent glory. One characteristic of the 84 Tigers was that it seemed they were never out of games. That's becoming increasingly apparent with their 20 years later brethren. Down but not out applies not to just Ozzy Osbourne. They played Friday night's game in an hour and 54 minutes here, only slightly longer than the career of Wang Chung. The post-game fireworks basically began at dusk. It took them an hour longer than that to play last night's game, but there were fireworks before the fireworks, and it was special because the greatest was here. Muhammad Ali was at the park, son playing in a baseball tournament in town. It was a punch and counterpunch kind of night. Carlos Guillen hit a first inning homer, and it was an early lead, though, that was wiped out in the third. Danny Bautista with a double to right scoring. Scott Hairston. It was a 2-1 game before Arizona exploded for four runs in the fifth inning. That's uh, Robbie Alomar's 500th career double. The D-backs up 5-2, but the Tigers kept pecking away. Guillen with the uh, third and fourth RBIs of the night, pulling the Tigers to within a run. And then it was 5-5 as Demetri Young delivered a shot to center that picked up Guillen. After the Snakes went up 6-5, Omar Infante ripped a rocket to left in the seventh. His sixth homer of the season and counterpunch. It was six apiece where it stayed until the ninth. Eric Munson wasn't even supposed to start last night. The Tigers were glad to have him. And this, a 457-foot rainbow, the longest homer in Comerica Park history into the camera well, a walk-off no-doubter. Munson called it the biggest hit of his career, mobbed at home plate, celebrating a 7-6 win, making Ali's appearance in the clubhouse after the game that much more special. He did some magic tricks and posed for some pictures, and when he posed with Infante, the champ gave Omar the bunny fingers. You may not remember that back in 1984, the second leading hitter on the Tigers that season was one Rod Allen. Though he only found his way into 15 games, but we're happy he's on our team now, and he's alongside a very special guest, Rod. Well, thank you very much, John. I'm here with a very special guest and a very special member of that 84 team. Of course, Sparky Anderson, the manager of that ball club, couldn't be here today. But Roger Craig, the pitching coach on that 84 Tigers championship team. Roger, welcome back. And what does it feel to you 20 years later? Well, Rod, you know, I, I went up uh, about a month ago because uh, I do a little bit of work with the Tigers and uh, to see this beautiful stadium compared to the other one. But we, we did love the other stadium. And, you know, we uh, it's unfortunate Sparky couldn't be yeah. here because he's the one that deserves all the credit for what happened in uh, in 84 and it was just a phenomenal year you know I was on a lot of great clubs the 55 Brooklyn Dodgers and the 64 Cardinals and so on but uh, that was a very special ball club you know we started out 35 and 5 <laughs> and and kept going from there but you know Toronto stayed on us all the way and uh, we had to battle to to win it but it was a phenomenal year and it's glad to, it's good to come back and see all the guys and the wives and all. Of course, you handled the pitching staff at that point in time. Talk about Jack Morris and Dan Petrie and, and Willie Hernandez all had wonderful years that year. Well, Jack Morris uh, over the years has been, been an ex-pitcher and pitching coach and manager. Jack, he's a Don Drysdale type <laughs> pitcher. He's a warrior. He was probably one of the best big game pitchers I've ever been around. When the, the bigger the game was, as we saw in a lot of the World Series, not only ours, the better Jack was. And Jack was a uh, super athlete and, and uh, you know he could have been a shortstop or second baseman and all but you know and he did a great job and, and he was our number one pitcher and uh, Petrie who won I think 17 or 18 games that year was a uh, outstanding young man and, and became a great pitcher and, and uh, he had a good hard slider and sometimes he got slider happy and threw too many of them but Milt Wilcox uh, He's one of the first guys that I really started teaching the uh, split split finger to. I took away his slot a little bit because he'd be pitching a good ball game, and then the eighth inning he'd give up a three-run dinger on that slider. But Wilt Milt was a real great competitor, kind of a he kind of had a mean streak in him, which you like in a pitcher. He wouldn't be afraid to knock you down or fight you if he had to. But you know, and, and Willie Hernandez, everybody said, "What did you do to make him so special?" I said, "Give him the ball in the ninth inning with a one-run lead." <laughs> All right, Roger, thank you very much for your time. I mean, it's going to be a wonderful day today. I'm looking forward to spending some time with you. Okay, All right, John, back to you. 
All right, Rodney, thank you. So many familiar faces, only a few more wrinkles, perhaps, from the days when they ruled Detroit back in 1984. One was a guy who found his way into the Tigers' mix when Detroit turned a deal with Chicago, and all of a sudden, the Tigers' center field worries were taken care of for the next nine years. Chet Lemon's best year as a Tiger, not coincidentally, was 1987, uh, or 1984, rather, when he hit 287. That was the year, of course, that the Tigers won it all as Chet Lemon had a career year, and he's happy to look back. Well, how big are the lies that are... Been... You know, John, those fish get bigger and bigger. <laughs> I'm telling you, but it's great. You know, Dave Bergman and, and I saw Dan Petrie today, and those guys are coaching, and, you know, uh, Daryl Evans and... You know, I spent some time with Tram and Lance and Gibby last year when I came down. So it's just great seeing all the guys again. And, you know, we were such a close group of, of, of players and teammates. And I think that the most important thing is that, you know, getting together and getting a chance to remember some of the things that we accomplished as a group. Something that we'll remember forever. Well, you will remember the stinking White Sox for, for so long. What was special about this group of Tigers that you joined? Well, you know, I often say that I was raised by the you know, Chicago White Sox, because I was 19 years old when I came to the big leagues, but Detroit taught me how to win. And, you know, I spent most of my career here in Detroit, and it was a great experience. And coming back here is wonderful. You know, the folks, are, they remember, you know, and they, they've been so kind, and they, they welcome you with open arms. So it's, it's great, and I think that's what makes it unique. Well, you look like you can still play, but a couple of years ago, you had a rather significant health scare. Take us through that and tell us how you're feeling these days. Well, I feel great right now, John. Um, what happened was that... Uh, I suffered with a real rare blood disorder called polycythemia vera. And uh, it simply means that my body produces uh, too many red blood cells. And right now, uh, I'm taking Coumadin, which keeps my blood, blood thin. thinner. Sure. Yes. And uh, Agrolin, which keeps my red blood platelets down. So I've been fine for about a year and a half now. Uh, I go about once a month to the Mayo Clinic. Um, they do uh, some tests. They run some tests on my blood, and everything has been great. So I, I feel wonderful. You had your spleen removed. Were there some anxious moments? How, how scared were you? Very, very. In fact, they didn't know if I was going to make it. If you can believe, I had a spleen about the size of seven, of seven and a half pounds. You know, wow. I, can, I can identify wow. with a woman carrying a... You know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because uh, this was unbelievable. And they said that, you know, it's real, real rare for anybody to endure what I had to endure with a spleen as large as uh, the spleen was that I had. But, you know, I'm very fortunate to be here. Very quickly, I know coaching has become your life. Is there a part of you that would like to coach alongside Tram and Gibby and, uh, and Lance? I'd love to coach again. I really, I mean, my son right now, I have two more years with him, but I would love to coach somewhere because I've had and developed such a great rapport with young youngsters, and uh, I love coaching. You know, I have a passion for the game of baseball, and I think if there's one thing about me, I think that I'm, I'm the kind of person that pays a lot of attention to detail. Even when I was playing the game, people ask, often ask me, you know, why do you think you play center field as well as you did? And I told him, I said, because I really studied the game. You know, when I used to def play defense against a guy like Rod Carew, he used to hate it because he hit so many line drives right sure. there. And I, I was standing right there and catch him. So, you know, but those are the kind of things that, uh, you know, I really enjoy. And I hope that one day I have an opportunity to coach somewhere. Well, these days he is the coach of Chet Lemon's Juice, a nationally regarded youth baseball team in Florida. In fact, they were playing in the World Series here in our town last summer and his post baseball life has qualified Chet Lemon to be our rejuvenating player of today's game. Of course he had that rare blood ailment that forced the removal of the spleen at a Florida hospital in December of 2001 and there were real concerns about his life. We're happy he's with us. He's rejuvenated his family and the rest of us with his presence. The rejuvenating player brought to you by Just For Men. More than a hair color, it's the rejuvenator. We are getting set to meet some of your 1984 World Series heroes. We are all anxious to see how they look these days and remember the good days of baseball in Detroit. More from Comerica next. All-Star game by purchasing a three-game or a six-game suite package today. Watch A-Rod and the Yankees along with other great games this summer from your very own luxury suite. For more information, call the Tigers at 313-471-2222. We continue to celebrate the 1984 World Champion Tigers. The ceremony is just about to begin, and one of those guys was a guy who had been a Yankee and an Astro and a Giant before Dave Bergman was acquired by the Tigers. 
just before the start of the 1984 season. He had always been primarily a role player. He was a first baseman. Of course, the Tigers had signed free agent first baseman Darrell Evans, but Berge still found his way into 120 games. That's how much a key contributor he was to the Tigers' world championship effort back in 1984. Reflecting on a lot of memories and also recognizing that we're getting older and we're <laughs> out of shape and we can't play anymore. And uh, it's just great to see a lot of the players that I haven't seen. I've been very fortunate that I've been able to stay in touch with quite a few of the players, but there have been some that I haven't seen since after the 84 season. And it gives us an opportunity to kind of catch up a little bit. You're one of the guys who has stayed in town and you've got a business that's flourishing. Does that make you perhaps more of a Tiger fan than some of your former colleagues? I really don't think so because after talking to a lot of these guys, they still follow the ball club. But I would like to like to think that I'm a huge Tiger fan, and being in town obviously makes it a little bit easier because I actually get a, a chance to interact with the players. You had knocked around a little bit as you were getting ready to come to Detroit. What kind of preconceived notions did you have about the team that you were joining? I knew immediately when I walked into spring training after Daryl Evans had told me, he says, this is a special ball club. And it was a, a very exciting time for me because when I walked into Sparky's office, he said, you're going to get 250 at bats this year. And I've never been told that before. And I didn't know whether to believe him or not because most of the time it's 250 today, maybe two sure. tomorrow. And uh, so I was just trying to get my feet on the ground a little bit and kind of get acclimated to the ball club. And, and after about three or four days, I said, wow, this is a special ball club. Well, they had Daryl Evans. Was there a part of you that thought, what am I getting myself into here? Because I'm a first baseman and he plays first base primarily. Well, my job really was no different, at, at least in my mind, when I came over here than it was in San Francisco when Daryl was playing first and third, that I was going to be kind of a pinch hitter, a spot starter, and, you know, play some outfield and, you know, basically be a utility type guy. But as the season turns out, I had a little bit more playing time than I had anticipated. We all have regrets. Is one of yours that those guys didn't win more, that you guys didn't win more than just the one championship? Or is that too greedy? Well, you want to be greedy in this game. There's no question about that. And, uh, you know, we came back in 1987, but we didn't have the same type of a ball club in 87 that we had in 84. It was a real grind for us in 1987. In fact, to be perfectly honest with you, I'm as proud or more proud of that team in 87 than I was the 84 team because everything fit in place perfectly in 84. In 87, it was like the piston season this year. Yeah. The guys came to the ballpark every day, strapped it on, and went out and played, and there was no complaining, and it was a kind of a Joel Lunchbucket-type team that played hard every day. But the repeat is very difficult unless you're just totally stacked with great players. It was a great scene in the Tiger Clubhouse just a few moments ago as these former teammates gathered again. And yes, 20 years has gone by, but you got the sense just being in their aura that they kind of picked up right where they left off. And some of the former Tigers are now being introduced to a most appreciative throng here at Comerica Park on a very special Sunday of baseball. The 84 heroes who have gathered here in Detroit again are uh, getting their chance to hear applause again from Detroit's terrific baseball fans, a fandom that truly remembers. The ceremony celebrating our anniversary because we have stock in it as well next as the Mike's Hard Lemonade Tigers pregame show continues. But there's Kirk Gibson, and he was a football player who played baseball. He had that football mentality. He had always been hardly the usual. The kid from Waterford in Michigan State was drafted by the NFL St. Louis Cardinals, but chose to play baseball, having been selected by his hometown team. He never had Hall of Fame numbers, but he was known for his sense of drama, his sense of clutch. And Gibby, who had told us he'd never be back in uniform, couldn't resist it when his friend Alan Trammell asked for his help. He'll be bench coaching again this afternoon against the Arizona Diamondbacks. But first things first, the ceremonies after this. Even close up. Seen, and it is terrific to see them gathered on a baseball diamond again. The 1984 World Champion Tigers on the 20th anniversary of that magical summer here in Detroit return to Detroit to Comerica Park this time. Many of them drove past Tiger Stadium, and perhaps they were just a bit wistful, but things move on, and the Tigers have moved here to Comerica Park, and most of them are truly just uh, in awe of the new place that the Tigers call home. There's Alan Trammell. He is uh, 
moved on to the point that he is now the manager of the 2004 Tigers, having been mentored by Sparky Anderson. Sparky could not be with us today. We're told that he's feeling just a little bit under the weather and has cut down on his schedule just a bit. He is Miss Sparky watching in California. We send our best to you. Dan Dickerson will be the public address announcer for today's ceremonies. We'll take you to the middle of the diamond now, and here's the radio voice of the Tigers, Dan Dickerson. Thank you very much. What a pleasure it is to be a part of the ceremonies this afternoon honoring the 1984 World Championship team. This was a team that absolutely turned this city on in the summer of 1984. My lasting memory of that summer is turning on the radio and listening to Ernie and Paul. And you just heard this constant roar coming from T T Tiger Stadium. It seemed like every single night. The wave was big that summer. Every game was loud, and right from the very start, you knew this was a special team. And after watching the Tigers the last two nights, watching the crowds here at Comerica Park, you get the sense that baseball is on its way back here in the city of Detroit, and the fans can't wait. <laughs> Detroit Tigers would like to thank the Detroit area Chevy dealers for providing those 2004 Chevy Avalanche vehicles that were used to bring the players and coaches in today. Before we begin today's ceremony, I'd like to recognize several special guests who have joined us here on the field. Please welcome Tigers President, CEO, and General Manager, Dave Dombrowski. A member of the 1968 World Champion Tigers and currently a special assistant to the President, Willie Horton. We all listened to a few games broadcast by this man over the course of 40 years. He was the sound of summer, and he's back this afternoon, Mr. Ernie Hartwell. And his constant partner over the course of 19 seasons, once described as the voice of God, his voice was that good broadcasting those middle innings, Paul Carey. Also joining us on the field, we have four representatives from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, which is the official sponsor of this 20th anniversary weekend celebration. Please welcome the Vice President of Community Affairs and Administration, Diana Jones. <laughs> Media Relations Director, Helen Stojic. The Director of Community Affairs and Employee Communications, Kathy Mosum and the Director of Retail Communications and Advertising, Bill Elwell. Now, before we meet all of the 1984 team members who joined us here today, we'd like to direct your attention to the video board in left field as we take a moment to look back and remember that great season of 1984. Under the watchful eye of legendary, the watchful eye of legendary skipper Sparky Anderson, the 1984 Tigers roared from the gate with the most dominating 40-game start in Major League history. Posting an incredible 35-5 record in its first 40 games, Detroit showed a national television audience they meant business on April 7th as Jack Morris tossed the Tigers' first no-hitter since 1958 in a 4-0 win over the Chicago White Sox. The Tigers sported a perfect blend of solid pitching and consistent offense as no team came within seven games of first place after the All-Star break. In Game 3 of the American League Championship Series against Kansas City, Tigers first baseman Darrell Evans made this game-saving stab to keep Milt Wilcox and the Tigers ahead 1-0. In the ninth inning, the AL's MVP and Cy Young Award winner in 84, Guillermo Hernandez, came on to shut the door as the Tigers swept the Royals in three straight games and headed to the World Series against the San Diego Padres. Game one in sunny San Diego saw the Padres holding a two to one lead in the fifth inning when Tigers outfielder Larry Herndon launched a two run home run to put Detroit in front. In the seventh, the Tigers defense stepped to the forefront. A perfect relay from Kirk Gibson to Lou Whitaker to Marty Castillo ended Kurt Bavacqua's journey at third base 
and the Tigers held on behind Jack Morris for the game one victory, three to two. After dropping game two to the Padres, five to three, the scene shifted back to Detroit for what would be the final three games of the series. In the second inning of game three, Marty Castillo started the scoring with a two-run homer to left field. Tigers shortstop and World Series MVP Alan Trammell increased the Tigers' lead with a double to left, scoring Lou Whitaker. But again, it was the Tigers' defense that made the difference as Chet Lemon tracked down this Terry Kennedy blast to center field to preserve the game three victory for Detroit, five to two. In game four, Alan Trammell led the Tigers' attack, belting a pair of two-run homers. In the first inning, this two-run shot off Eric Shaw gave Detroit the early lead. Then in the third inning, Trammell's second two-run bomb into the upper deck gave the Tigers a 4-1 to one lead. Jack Morris again went the distance in the 4-2 to two win as Detroit grabbed a commanding three games to one lead in the series. The stage was now set for the fifth and final game of this historic season. Game five's dramatic role starred Tiger outfielder Kirk Gibson. With Trammell aboard in the first inning, Gibson launched a tremendous home run to right field to stake Detroit to an early 2-0 lead. But it was only the beginning of Gibson's heroics. In the eighth inning, with the Tigers clinging to a 5-4 lead, Gibson stepped to the plate to face Goose Gossage in what was about to become one of the most famous confrontations in World Series history. Gibson drove a Gossage fastball into the night for a three-run homer as the Tigers and their fans prepared for the team's first World Series celebration since 1968. Larry Herndon made the final catch as the 84 Tigers completed the dream season, winning the World Championship in five games over the San Diego Padres. Ladies and gentlemen, 20 years later, we welcome back and salute our 1984 world champion, Detroit Tigers. Now let's meet those 1984 world champion Tigers. As we introduce each individual member of the Tiger staff, we'll present them with a very handsome, eight inch tall, double handle, fine crystal trophy engraved with the old English D and the words 1984 world champions, 20th anniversary, June 27th, 2004. By the way, on this date in, in 1984, Detroit Tigers had a 53 and 20 record. This reserve outfielder hit 296 in limited action during the 84 campaign, but his playing career spanned 15 years. Also included big league stops in Seattle and Cleveland. Today, he is a television analyst for the Detroit Tigers baseball on Fox Sports Net Detroit. Number 12, Rod Allen. This crafty middle reliever was an important part of the Tigers' bullpen in 84, a bullpen that just did yeoman work. Right-hander appeared in 47 games, worked 94 innings in those 47 games, won five games, he saved four. A key member of the world champion pitching staff in 1984, number 40, Doug Bear. This gritty first baseman was a solid fielder as well as very consistent at the plate. He hit 273 in both the first and second halves of the 84 season. And I think a lot of us here today can remember exactly where we were on that June night in 1984, listening to Ernie Harwell describe his 13 pitch at bat against Roy Lee Jackson of the Toronto Blue Jays. A 13 pitch at bat that ended with a three run homer that won the game. Number 14, Dave Bergman. He handled the hot corner for much of his 10 years here in Detroit, played three different infield positions throughout the 1984 season, and he hit 273 in the second half. Number 16, Tom Brookins.
Of course, a member of the 1968 championship team, he served as a hitting coach in 1984. In addition to a team batting average of 271, the club excelled in what else? Pinch hitting situations. They learned from the master. Number 26, Gates Brown. Known for his knowledge of the split-finger fastball, this man served as a Tigers pitching coach for five years. Later went on to manage the San Francisco Giants, took them to a couple of division titles. Welcome back, pitching coach number 38, Roger Craig. <laughs> Longtime trainer for the team, he joined the Tigers organization in 1970. He served as the Tigers trainer for 15 years, from 1980 through 1994. Please welcome back, Pio DeSalvo. Another key role player on the 84 team, his consistent batting average of 287, his nine RBIs as a pinch hitter, made him a very valuable offensive threat off the bench. Number 27, Barbaro Garbet. One of the most intense competitors to ever play this game. He had a flair for the dramatic in his World Series career. His two home runs in game five put an exclamation point on the 1984 season. He has brought that intensity back to the Tigers' dugout as the Tigers' bench coach, number 23, Kurt Gibson. A valuable member of Sparky Anderson's coaching staff, he spent 12 years as a Tigers coach from 1980 through 1991. Number 51, Alex Grammis. He was the biggest offensive threat off the bench in 1984. His 364 average, three home runs as a pinch hitter, provided the Tigers with instant offense in the clutch. Number 30, John Grubb. This man turned in one of the most dominating pitching performances in Major League history during the 84 season. A 192 ERA, 32 saves and 33 opportunities. It earned him the American League Cy Young and also the league's most valuable player. That's only been done two other times in the history of baseball. A reliever winning both those awards in the same season. The Tigers closer in 1984, number 21, Willie Hernandez. He spent only one season with the Tigers, but it was a memorable one. He had a career-high 284 for the world champion Tigers, also boasted a career-best 516 slugging percentage in that season. A 12-year Major League Baseball veteran, number 32, Rupert Jones. <laughs> Voted to the All-Star Game starting lineup in 84, he hit 287 that season. One of the top defensive outfielder by American League managers. He tracked down Terry Kennedy's drive, as you saw a moment ago, to preserve that game three win in the World Series. Number 34, Chet Lemon. <laughs> Known as the big wheel during his playing days. He was a key component in the Tigers' drive to the World Championship. This catcher hit a rather big home run in Game 5 earlier in the game. An eight-time All-Star, he now serves as the Tigers' bullpen coach. Lucky number 13, Lance Parrish. <laughs> he 
He won 18 games in 1984. He had the lowest ERA of any Tigers starting pitcher that year at 324. He also fired seven complete games and two shutouts that season. Number 46, Dan Petrie. The Tigers Rookie of the Year in 1977, he started 16 games in 84, provided strong middle relief for the World Championship bullpen. Number 19, Dave Rosema. <laughs> Currently in his 27th season with the Tigers, he was in charge of the World Championship Clubhouse in 1984, and he is still Detroit's clubhouse manager and doing a great job 20 years later. Mr. Jim Schmeichel. Another member of the 68 World Championship team, he also served on the Tigers coaching staff from 1972 until 1995. Please welcome back Dick Trzuski. A 17-game winner in 1984, he was the winning pitcher in Game 3 of the World Series. Also teamed with Guillermo Hernandez on a 1-0 shutout in the third and final game of the American League Championship win over Kansas City. Number 39, Milt Wilcox. He was a bullpen catcher for this magnificent team. And it's good to see him back in Detroit on this very special weekend. He wore number 39, Dan Whitmer. Before we hit, hear from some of the members of the 84 team, let's hear first from a Detroit sports broadcasting legend, the voice of the Detroit Tigers in 1984 and for more than 40 years. And for some of us, he is the only voice we remember growing up. Please welcome back Ernie Harwell. Thank you, folks. Thank you, Dan. And before I begin my remarks, Dan, I want to congratulate you and Jim Price on your performance as the radio voice of the Detroit Tigers. It's uh, great to be here with all you folks and to relive those uh, magic moments of the 1984 championship season. This 84 team was one of the great teams of the baseball history. These champions were one of the three champions in all of baseball that ever led the league from start to finish, wire to wire. And they're in good company the only other two teams that did it were the fabled 27 New York Yankees and the 1955 Brooklyn Dodgers. After the Tigers started 35 and 5, they went on to win 104 games, the most ever by any Tiger team. It was a magic year. After winning their division, they swept the Kansas City team in the playoffs and then beat the San Diego with ease in the World Series. Some of those memories of this 1984 season, what about the wave? The wave started at Tiger Stadium in 1984. And then there was Herbie Redmond. Remember Herbie, the dancing groundskeeper? And the slogan, bless you boys. And what was the theme song that year? It was Dancing in the Streets, performed by Motown's great Martha Reeves and the Vendellas. We brought Martha over here on our walk from Blue Cross Blue Shield headquarters to Comerica Park, and it's great that she can still dance in the streets with us. But there's so many memories, folks. We've got Jack Morris's no-hitter. We've got the pitching of Milt Wilcox, despite the fact that he had a sore arm the 18 victory season of the steady Dan Petrie, the wonderful bullpen headed by Willie Hernandez and Senior Smoke. Then we've got the great team spirit of 
Dave Bergman, and that fabulous 13 pitch time at bat that Dan mentioned. We had the commanding presence back of home plate of the big wheel, Lance Parrish. We had the great leadership and the home run power of Darrell Evans. We had the humor and versatility of Tommy Brookins and the greatest keystone combination of all time, Lou Whitaker and Lou Trammell. And we all rejoice when Alan Trammell was named the MVP of the World Series. Then there was Larry Herndon with his quiet dignity and the great center field catches of Chet Lemon. And Kurt Gibson in that magnificent home run off the goose. We had a wonderful coaching staff put together by Sparky Anderson, and they're here with us. And then there was Sparky himself, who led the team with a good, firm, and fair leadership. It was a wonderful year, and I'm happy to be here with all you folks to pay tribute to this team, salute them, and tell you that it was a great time for all of us. God bless you. Our next speaker saw a lot of these 1984 Tigers come up through the farm system in the late 70s and the early 80s. 1968 champion in his own right. Please welcome the Tigers' special assistant to the president, Mr. Willie Horton. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to give thanks to God who held my life. It's an honor to be here today to pay tribute to a group of guys that made history in 1984. And these group of guys put their robe back in the Tigers fan and, and put the robe back in the T Detroit Tiger organization. Detroit has always been a town of hard workers. And these guys sitting behind me, this group, they represent what Detroit is all about. They worked together and stuck together together as a baseball team and would bring a sweet reward, a 1968 World Championship home. I knew I was going to get emotion because they part of me also. You guys set example how baseball should be played on the field. You know, I sit up last night and I said, well, what, what can I come up with a word to describe this, these group of guys? And I came up with Desmond. This group had Desmond as a winner, brought a world champion to this city of Detroit and this great state of Michigan. And I'm standing here today, and I'm so proud to be part of these guys behind me. And the effort that y'all brought a championship in 1984 back to the city would never be forgotten. In closing, I'd like to thank Mr. Illich and his family for allowing Willie Horton to continue being part of this great organization. Having Alan Tramon, Kurt Gibson, Lance Paris, Tram coaching staff. I'd like to say with a structure that we have in place that we're going to put another World Series team on this field. And I promise you that. <laughs> I'd like to say thanks to the guys behind me for allowing me to be part of the special day. God bless you. Thank you. Our next speaker is in his 26th season in Major League Baseball. He was the architect of the 1997 world champion Florida Marlins. And I think you can make a pretty convincing case the architect of the 2003 world champion Florida Marlins. He is currently the president, CEO, and general manager of this great franchise. And he is working very hard to bring a fifth world championship back here to Detroit. Please welcome Dave Dombrowski.
Thank you, Dan. In 1984, the last thing any baseball fan felt would happen is that any club would run away with the strongest division in baseball, the American League East. The 35 and 5 start, the best start in baseball history, caught everybody by surprise. However, led by a Hall of Fame manager in Sparky Anderson and a great club built through the farm system, supplemented by key players through big trades, this club roared through the regular division as well as the postseason and brought a world championship to Detroit. To all of us, this was really representative of a team. The grit and determination that they showed from day one was obvious to anybody that played this club. The star power of this club, to me, hasn't been recognized to this day, because not only was it a team, and had a Hall of Fame manager in Sparky. But the baseball world should recognize the Hall of Fame players that were on this team. People like Alan Trammell, Lance Parrish, Lou Whitaker, Jack Morris. This was one of the greatest clubs put together in recent times. And for all of us that are part of this organization at this time, it gives us a true goal to reach what these guys have achieved. And we're going to put our best foot forward day in and day out to follow this great club. Thank you and congratulations to this club. Now let's hear from the final two 84 Tigers. First, he was a leader in the clubhouse and on the field in 1984. He had just been signed as a free agent. And if you remember that summer and when he was signed before that season began, it was a big deal that he was coming to Detroit. He hit 40 home runs the following year and led Detroit in home runs for four straight years. Please welcome back number 41, Darrell Evans. I know that uh, a lot of you weren't around when we, we won back then, but uh, some of you were. And, I, and you know the excitement that that, that year brought, uh, coming in new from a new league and uh, not really knowing how great of players we had on this club. Uh, but the first day of spring training, I found that out. There was some expertise in the clubhouse about how we were going to win starting that first day, and uh, we followed through on that. But I think one of the biggest things, the reason why this club was so good was that they learned from their mistakes and they had the best heart of any club I've ever been on. Uh, played for 14 years before I got a chance to be in a World Series and I cherish that every single day. But especially because of the guys that are on this club and every single one of us here appreciates I think doing it in this city in front of you fans, because if we did it anywhere else, it wouldn't mean near as much. So I want to thank you for that. Uh, everybody that wears that D is very, very proud of it. And uh, we hope that we can come back and do this again. Uh, it's so great to see your teammates and to remember all the great moments that we went through. And I'm glad that you got a chance to do it with us. So thanks for having us here. And uh, we'd like to come back and do this again. Thanks for all your support. Sir, appreciate it. Thank you. Our final speaker today defines what it is to be a world champion. His leadership and commitment to Tigers baseball continues today. After 20 years as the Tigers shortstop, 20 years as the Tigers shortstop, he is now in his second year as manager of the Detroit Tigers, the 1984 World Series MVP, number three, Alan Trammell. Thank you. It is great to be back with my, 
My teammates from 20 years ago, again, I think we all would say, I don't know where the years have went, but it's great to see some of the guys. We don't see each other all that often, but the fact of the matter is to reminisce and to think about the greatest year, I know from speaking for myself, bar none, the best year that I had in baseball, just wish we could have done it again. I would like to pay, first of all, the reason that this club was successful and as successful as it was, in my opinion, was from one guy. And that one guy was Sparky Anderson. <laughs> Unfortunately, Sparky couldn't be here today, but I know that filling his shoes as a Tiger manager, I wear this English D with a great amount of pride that is Lance and Gibby and everybody else. But the reason why we were as good as we were is that we put in the time and Sparky, as the father figure that he was, taught us how to play the game the right way. And I was just talking to Rupert Jones here a few minutes ago, and he was talking to Reggie Jackson years ago, and Reggie asked Rupert, what was the best team you ever played on? And he said, by far, it was the 1984 Tigers. And I think his message was that Reggie was taken back, and I think we know what a great player Reggie is and was, and he has a little bit of an ego. He might have been a little set back, but that's okay. I believe that. It was a special year from day one, the 35-5 and five start, to win the, champion, the, the pennant here in Detroit, to beat Kansas City here in Detroit, and to beat the Padres here in Detroit. All three celebrations right here in the Motor City didn't get any better than that. And you can be assured that for me, wearing this old English D, which I do wear with great pride, that we're trying to build a championship team here. We're making some strides. We got a little ways to go, but I think it's been night and day from last year that we're on the right track and we are committed to bring in another championship here into Detroit. Thank you very much. It's been a great day. Thank you for coming. That concludes our ceremony. We want to say thank you to all of you for coming out here today. Thank you for helping us honor this great world championship team. Have a great afternoon. One last time, the 1984 world champion Detroit Tigers. There is a great aura in the building as Detroit says thank you once again to the 1984 world champs for Alan Trammell and Lance Parrish and Kirk Gibson. There is still work to be done. Their day will be complete with a Tiger victory over the Arizona Diamondbacks. Oh, by the way, there is a ball game to be played this afternoon. Another former Tiger has made his way to Comerica Park. Steve Sparks not necessarily with as much history as those gentlemen. But the Tigers are happy to see him back because of the person he is. And yet they'll try to beat him this afternoon. We'll talk more about the pitching matchup when we come right back. MLS is back. Terrific crowds all weekend long and really all season long as Detroit is catching on to the improvements that the Tigers have made this season. They will go for their fourth straight win here this afternoon after that little bit of a lull. And they'll try to finish off a sweep against the Arizona Diamondbacks. And even though he's pitching for the other guys, Steve Sparks is considered to be only one of the better people on the planet. We take delight in some of his recent good fortune. The former Tiger is in a four-start stretch in which his ERA is just 1.73. Ten days ago, he beat the vaunted Yankees 6-1. to one. The best year of his career was here in Detroit in 2001 when Sparky went 14-9 with that 3.65 earned run average and an American League leading eight complete games. But he struggled the next year, was pitching mostly out of the bullpen last year prior to his release on August 27th. On the day of his release, there was a palpable pall over the ballpark. That's how well regarded he is as a teammate. His close friend Mike Moroth starts against the D-backs, and he loves pitching at home. Moroth is 3-0, allowing just a shade over two runs per nine innings here at Comerica. Last year's lousy luck is like a dog on his leg. Get off. He's just 1-4 in his last seven starts, but his ERA in that span, just 3.5, which is plenty good enough 
in most instances, Mike Baroth trying to handcuff the Arizona Diamondbacks here in the series finale this afternoon. The Tigers with that dramatic 7-6, ninth inning walk-off home run win over the Diamondbacks here last night. Eric Munson hit it as far as anyone has ever hit a ball at Comerica Park. It was against the reliever Brandon Villafuerte, another former Tiger. This one traveled 457 feet into a place where our cameras are. Now, here is the view that the cameraman saw right there when the ball landed right into the camera well. And one of our colleagues, Tom Hughes, having had the daylight scared out of him, is holding on to the ball that Eric Munson hit. No one has hit a ball further than Eric Munson did last night. And in dramatic fashion, the Tigers mob Munson at home plate, celebrating a 7-6 win. And that's the kind of good fortune that they are trying to continue here this afternoon. Perhaps helped a bit by the magic left by ghosts of the past. From 20 years ago, the 1984 Tigers have been honored. The 2004 Tigers will try to follow up those ceremonies with a dramatic win over Arizona here this afternoon. It was a terrific time in our baseball past. Baseball success that, as we look back upon it, was positively presidential. All I can say is, uh, bless you boys.